So, yes, um, I'm talking uh, on the status uh, of Baby IXO. And um, to start with, I just want to introduce the Axion very quickly, but uh, since Mario has mainly said you ever see everything on it already, uh, I will just quickly go through it after the coffee break. So, it's a pseudo number Goldstone boson, and it's a solution for many problems in physics. For example, the strong CP problem and it could be also a solution for dark matter. There's a lot of experimental approaches going on. Um, it has some astrophysical hints, and it also drops out of a lot of theories, so it's a very well-established um, particle um, to search for. Uh, and one nice thing is it couples to photons, and this is what we are using uh, for the helioscope approach and also for other experiments. And basically to find it, there's three types of major experimental uh, ways to do that, um, which is with uh, haloscopes, which we heard a lot of talks already about it. So they are looking for a dark matter halo, and they have a strong model dependence, which is not so nice. Then there are lag experiments, which is mainly light shining through wall. They have very low um, uh, dependence on models because they're basically producing their axions or ARPs themselves, and then they, they're looking for them in a second uh, step. Um, and there is the third approach where I will be talking about, and those are the helioscopes, um, where we have a low model dependence because we're looking for axions which are basically coming out from the sun due to the uh, many photons um, <coughs> which are inside the sun. And um, so if the axion exists, it should be produced by the sun. Um, so how is a helioscope basically working? So as I said, our... Uh, Sun is producing the axions. They then travel to the Earth. There we use a strong magnetic field to produce virtual photons, where the axion then is mixing with and making out of our virtual photon a real photon. And those real photons can then basically, since they are X-rays, um, detected by an X-ray detector. So how is the spectrum from the, from the Sun looking? So we can see basically two major processes from the sun, so which is on one hand the uh, photon, photon coupling, which is the Primakov effect, which is quite small, so it's enhanced here in the plot to see it better. And the other one is the uh, photon-electron coupling, which is then giving you this um, basically back outline, um, which is then peaking at very low energies, so it's about 1 keV, 1.5 keV, while the photon-photon coupling is peaking at about 3 kilo electron volts of energy. And um, we have to keep in mind that the energy which the axion gets here, so when, when it's produced at 1 keV, it will also get or bring out at the end a photon of 1 keV. And our back coupling is of course only a photon-photon back coupling, so we, we have to rely on the Primakov effect um, to, to measure our axions. Um, so, with the basic principle of the, of the helioscope, we can then uh, build the advanced helioscope where we, in addition to just a magnetic field, use on one end that we can also, of course, point a magnet to the sun, so we follow the sun, which is, of course, enlarging the time you can look for the axions, and then we use X-ray telescopes or X-ray optics to basically focus uh, uh, more of those photons onto our detector on a small spot, so we have basically a signal-to-noise enhancement. And the, the, the sensitivity of those advanced telescopes are basically made up uh, out of those four factors. So, of course, the magnet and the magnetic field and the length and the area of the magnet is one. Um, the other one is the efficiency of the optics. Um, the third one is the efficiency and the background of the detectors. And, of course, the measurement time as you can all imagine. Um, so we'll now go to the, through the first three ones, step by step. So starting um, with the magnet, then going to the optics, and at the end to the detectors, because the time is a bit uh, uninteresting, because we all know looking longer <laughs> will help. Um, but first, um, let's get an overview how we processed from cast, where we had like a 20 year long experience with these helioscopes to baby Ajaxo and Ajaxo. So <coughs> after CAST was, was, was very, very successfully used 
to look for axions. We then thought about uh, how, can we, how can we make this better? How can we make this bigger? And we invented basically IXO, where we have a very big magnet, which is 20 meters long, and which has eight bores. So we can basically use eight experiments at the same time with a movement structure which can point to the sun about half of the day. Uh, while we use the other, the other half, half of the day for the background um, measurement. Um, but since this is a very big experiment, we thought it would be good to have a technology demonstrator first, which is also capable to produce new physics. And this is then how baby IXO occurred. So there we have only a 10 meter long magnet, but basically the same magnet technology, uh, but in this case also only two magnet bores. And um, this is then quite a bit smaller and uh, will be built at DZ uh, in the future, or is starting to be built at DZ now. And um, to go to the physics, we all know those exclusion plots. And even, so, so we have here the limit of cast, which is the blue line, or the, 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 the light blue part here. And with baby Ayaxo, we will push this even slightly down, about a bit less than one order of magnitude. And with the final Ayaxo, we will push it then really like one order of magnitude or even a bit more, depending on how at the end the magnet and the experiment will perform. One thing you might wonder about is, you see always those, those very straight line and then it goes up a little bit. And then you see these, these very, let's say fuzzy end and this is due to the fact that with the with, with a normal helioscope, with, which has a vacuum inside the, the, the magnet, um, you can only measure axions up to a certain mass. And then after that, it starts to decay, and you would basically have a straight line up here, which is then going to this part and then dropping out. But you can enhance this by using a buffer gas inside your magnet, but this only use, will only give you a peak at a certain mass, and so you have to change a lot of pressure steps and, and you see all those steps. So you have one step and then you go one step further and then of course you have a drop in between um, the two steps. So this is why you always have these, these fuzzy curves at the end in the exclusion plots. Um, so coming to the magnet now, um, the magnet of, of baby axa consists, as I said, of two bores. Each bore has a 70 centimeter inner diameter, um, which is at the beginning of the experiment filled with vacuum. Um, the magnetic field in the, in the central part is about two Tesla, and the whole magnet is uh, 10 meters long. All the parts are now basically ready and designed, so we started with the, with the tendering of the cryostat and the inner parts. Um, the only problem we have at the moment, uh, or which is a bit delaying, is that we wanted to use an old conductor which uh, could have been given to us by the INR in Russia. Sadly, this conductor had, after we looked at it, too many defects, so we had to drop this idea. And um, now um, we are looking for a new conductor, so writing down the specifications to order it. Um, we cannot use a copper conductor because on one hand, the thermal conductivity is too low for the cryostat, and on the other hand, since we want to move it at the end, it will be just too heavy. So um, we have to go for an aluminum stabilized conductor, and um, which is maybe looking like this. And the tendering and the specifications are making good progress, so we will see um, <coughs> when we get a final date for the conductor to build the magnet. So <coughs> with the magnet on hand, or with the magnet basically planned, we can then go for our X-ray optics. Um, for the X-ray optics, we have basically three options at the moment. One is an XMM uh, flight spare, which we will be uh, lent from ESA. So this one is built, it's ready, it's standing uh, in a clean room and basically awaiting us to uh, install it. Uh, and the second um, optics will be a custom-built optic, which is also then the demonstrator for the IXO optics. Um, which will be either have a new star or x rism uh, like core and the cold slammed glass uh, outer corona optics. So it's a hybrid optic. So we have an inner part, um, which is 
basically filling the first 40 centimeters and then an outer part which is going uh, for the rest up to the 70 centimeters of the bore diameter. Um, those optics are using different technologies. So we have cold slump glass for the outer corona. We have segmented glass for the um, new star core or foil, uh, so foil optics uh, like the, the X-RISM uh, satellite mission is using. But saying we're using a hybrid optics made out of two, so of course we have to think about how to mount those two optics and how to align them. This is now ongoing. So here you can see how to basically push them together. So we have here the uh, inner core optic and the uh, outer corona. This then has, of course, to be aligned with the, with the magnet and with the detectors. And this can be done by different technologies. So we are now simulating how you can basically look if the, if the optics is turned, uh, turned in, 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 to the optical axis. Um, so you can basically build a star in the middle of, this, of, your, of your optics and look where this is uh, looking like a star or with this changing shape. And if it's changing shape, you can see that this is in this case, for example, turned by 0.1 degrees. For the detectors, there's different technologies um, evolving. Um, we have a baseline, which is a micromegas detector, which is very well known for, the, for all the cast people. It has a very good background and it's, it's very deliberate. Um, a lot of variety of other detectors are also in development, so we have a group which is looking for SCD detectors, for microcalorimeters, for transition edge detectors, and the group where I am from, we are looking for those grid picks detectors. You can see some pictures of the different technologies up here. So this is the microcalorimeter, for example, and um, that's the micromegas. All those different technologies have uh, different options. So the baseline, of course, is has the, the best characteristics so far, while the other ones, for example, the microcalometers have a fantastic energy resolution in, in the order of evolves. Um, the STD has the very nice feature that you can mount it uh, inside the vacuum system. Um, and uh, our grid pix detector has a very low energy uh, uh, threshold while also having a very high granularity so you can really construct your events spatially. So how does such a detector work? And I will do this by the grid picks, which is also a micromegas detector. So you basically have a, have a gas volume, which is then mounted to your experiment via a window where the incoming photon is then uh, converting uh, in the gas into electrons. So it's producing a photoelectron, which is then producing further electrons out of the gas. They are inside a drift field, drifting down to your um, readout section where you basically have a micro mesh on top of a, of a readout system. In our case, this is a pixelized um, readout chip with a photolithographically and perfectly aligned grid on top. So we have like 55 times 55 micrometer pixels. And if an electron hits this hole it's inside the grid, there is a very strong field below, which is then amplifying your electron by a factor of three to 5,000. Uh, so you can have a measurable signal from, from each electron. You can basically, with this, do then single electron countings, and for this, you get also your energy back. As I said, we, we have a gaseous volume, so we need a window on top. This is also something we, we are looking at. Since, since I said the peak is at like 1 keV, your windows, of course, have to be very thin while also keeping a barrier between your gas, which is at basically normal pressure, so one bar, and uh, the rest of the system is at vacuum. Um, so it has to withstand those, those, this pressure difference. It has to be vacuum tight and it has to be as thin as possible. Um, that's why we, we are developing those windows. Here you can see a window which has a thickness of 300 nanometers, which you can see in the plot um, as the purple line. Um, so that's very nice. And we are now looking that we are um, trying to get those even thinner to get even more sensitive in this, in this, in this major area at, at around 1 keV. Now at the end I want to show you just some events of such a detector and, and some nice features. So you can see how such events look like on the detector. So you see basically those round shapes, which are typically, typically for a photon because they're converting at one place. And then all the photons start to drift down and diffuse while drifting down. 
And with the number of pixels, you can then basically see how much energy they have. Um, and here in the first one, you see basically three photons. And here you would maybe, maybe guess there is one photon. But if you then look um, on the time axis, you can see that this is not a photon, but this is rather a muon track, which is coming in perpendicular to your detector. And in the other one, you can even see that there were four photons incoming. And yeah, our collaboration is um, basically all over the world and summarize the talk. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this very clear presentation. Are there some questions or comments in the audience? Thank you for a great talk. At some point you said, you on your slides, you said that uh, baby AXA will be 100 times more sensitive than um, cast. Yes. It, 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 what exactly do you mean? Because the, on the plot that you then showed, it looked like it was... Yeah, that's uh, because of the scaling of the GA gamma. So, it, so the sensitivity is, is, is higher, but the GA gamma is going by a factor of, I think, to the square root or to the fourth. So. Okay, so when the, you say the sensitivity, it's not, it's not the, the, the overall sensitivity, but the sensitivity basically signal to noise. To, to events. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, are you able to quantify or, or ballpark some numbers for the energy resolutions and thresholds for these detectors you mentioned, like MMC and grid pick? So I heard at some point that perhaps even like sub EV resolution might be possible with a MMC. Is this still? Realistic, do you think? To, to get an, an e volt resolution with a microcalorimeter. I think it's possible. So I think they, they claim that they got up to like six EV line widths at the moment. But uh, I'm not an expert on this microcalorimeter, so I cannot say what's the, the best threshold at the moment they got. But I think it's in the, in the low EV range somewhere. I, I, if I may, um, so the the projections you showed for, for baby AXO um, presumably make some assumption about how much time you'll spend with vacuum, how much time you'll spend using buffer gas. Is, is that still the case? Have you actually made a, a firm plan for, for the strategy that you'll, you'll do for the scan and the vacuum mode? So w with the vacuum, the scan time is, is basically around whatever, three months per detector, or maybe, maybe six months per detector, and then you normally reach the background level of the detector. So even with longer times, you would not get a really better limit. Mm -hmm. um, with the scanning with gas inside, of course, you have to, have to figure out how much time you want to spend per step and how small you want to do the steps at the end, and then how long you want to run with the full system. Um, but that's not yet fixed. Because yeah, okay. That's 